Hey everyone, I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Welcome everyone to today's Rupa Live class presented by Rupa University, the best way to learn about lab work from industry experts. My name is Adrian Martinez, and as always, I will be your host for today's session. Today, we have a very, very special guest, and Dr. James Lavelle, we're here with Infinite Allergy to walk us through the game-changing impact of advanced food allergy and sensitivity testing for athletes at all levels. Before jumping in, a couple of quick housekeeping items, everyone joining will be muted by default. But don't fret, if you have any questions, use that Q&A button down in your menu bar and we will host a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Immediately following the Q&A, I will show you exactly how to order these infinite allergy tests directly on Rupa Health. And if you have to jump early or maybe you joined a little late, no worries at all. We are recording this session as we always do and we'll send it out along with the slides within the coming days. And if you're a fan of this type of content, be sure to check out rupauniversity.com to see all the previous sessions that we have done, including those with Dr. Lavelle. And finally, Finally, we are very happy to uh, say a partnership coupon that we have going on with Infinite Allergies. So more to come on that, and we'll send out the details very shortly, likely with the recording. But with that, let's go ahead and jump in. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jim Lavelle. Dr. Lavelle is an internationally recognized clinical pharmacist, author, and board-certified clinical nutritionist with over 35 years of clinical experience. Lavelle is best known for his expertise in performance, health, and integrative care, with personally seeing thousands of clients over the years. He is the founder of Metabolic Code Enterprises and was voted National Clinician of the Year in 2012 by the Natural Products Association and was the Educator of the Year in 2017 for the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine, also known as A4M. Also, he's the author of the newly released Professional Handbook Guide to Peptide Therapy. Find it on Amazon. Thank you so much for joining us today. I will go ahead and let you take it from here. Oh, that's great. Thanks for having me. And uh, always excited when I get to get it on uh, Rupa University. You guys do a great job of educating folks. You know, I, I just came back from the MBA Summit, uh, and my lecture at the MBA Summit was all about the fact that you can never separate biomechanics from biochemistry. You know, when I was talking there, because all the teams were there with their strength coaches and their orthos and you know, everybody's worrying about what, well, how do you measure load and what's your dual force power plate and what's the return to play based on physical therapy. But when I talked to them, it was obvious that a lot of times players don't make it back in time. They don't make it in the expected amount of time. And when I started to explain to them the various loads that occur on people biochemically, meaning they're used to thinking of biomechanic load, I kind of enlightened them on biochemical load. You know, it kind of, lit them up. You know, you think that there would be more advancements uh, in looking at nutrition, in looking at absorption. Uh, remember, 50% of all non-contact injuries in professional sports or in, in athletes in general are due to imbalances in nutrition. And imbalances in nutrition can occur either because of just straight diet or because gut permeability problems leading to reduced absorption. And that's what we're going to go through today. Um, a lot of this information is pretty much brand new, uh, published over the last, you know, maybe year or six months. Uh, and so, you know, you know, first, you know, athlete food intolerance issues. This is an NFL star. And you know, I work with, you know, NHL teams, NFL teams, NBA teams, uh, Major League Soccer teams, spec ops, you name it. Um, we're always looking at performers as well as the, you know, kind of the other half of the practice, the sick population. Everything I do as an athlete, I think about maximizing performance. So anything I put in my body, I think about how's it going to help me perform at the highest level and how's it going to help me recover the fastest. So if you have allergy intolerances to certain types of foods and you're putting those into your body, your body's constantly fighting those foods as opposed to repairing muscle and helping you with recovery or performance. Yeah, the bottom line is how do we maintain homeostasis? What we call how do we maintain resiliency or post-injury, how do you get back to return to play? Got a lot of amateur athletes out there, guys. You got people that are doing triathlons. They spend a lot of money on, you know, the next hottest bike seat, the next lightest set of shoes, you know, the next lightest weight bike. And just like when we worked with Corvette Race Team, they spend $50 million on a race car. They didn't spend any money on the athlete driving the race car, right? So that's what this is really about is, if people are performing and they're wanting to exercise, no matter what level that's at, that's only going to get better if you can identify 
areas like food allergies and sensitivities and, and how that comes about, right? So first of all, what's the impact on the athlete? Well, first increased inflammation and soreness, right? If, and, and you've seen this, if you've worked with food allergies, people end up, oh, my hips are sore. I can't recover. Um, um, you know, three days later, you know, they're eating gluten and dairy, or maybe they, you know, got a rich history on antibiotics. So they, they got dysbiosis. Uh, you don't get full absorption of nutrients. I see this all the time. I just had a 14 year old. He's grown six inches in about five months now since we corrected for his actually celiac that we found. Uh, immune shifts. Athletes are prone to getting sick. And when they get sick, they get put on antibiotics. They get put on antibiotics, it messes up their gut. Uh, and when they, and, or they're, um, you know, they get a cold or flu. If you're out a week or you miss a game, say your NFL season, and now you're, you, you miss 115th. And it's just being sick. Ownership doesn't necessarily like that. They want to keep their players healthy, keep them on the field. That's what they're paying them for. And obviously, the you know the obvious you know diarrhea, constipation, dehydration issues, cardiovascular disease issues as they move into the future towards their retirement, um, and increased length of time of return to play. Number one thing I talk about all the time with strength coaches and and the uh, the, the physical therapy staff. And then brain coherence and cognitive capacity, when your gut gets permeable, the enteric nervous system gets upregulated. Now, all of a sudden, you're sending inflammatory signs, uh, um, signaling up to the, to the microglial cells. And now the microglial cells are creating an inflammatory response, right? The immune patrolling cells in the brain start triggering that oxidative stress. And that leads to a lack of brain coherence. Why is that important? As you lose brain coherence, you, you lose your ability to respond with your reflexes at your optimal uh, capacity. Bottom line is, is you get poor performance. So, you know, GI complaints, probably one of the most common and frequent complaints, especially in the endurance athlete. We all hear the term runner's diarrhea, right? But you'll, you'll see a lot of irritable bowel uh, in endurance sports, even in the, you know, like basketball is kind of an endurance event. Soccer, we get a lot of GI stuff with our soccer players. So the longer and intense the prolonged exercise is, it induces dysbiosis uh, amongst a bunch of other things that I'm going to share with you. So obviously, you know, nausea, cramping, diarrhea, bloating, some athletes throw up before the game uh, even. Uh, so they're more susceptible to food sensitivities as they're creating this increased sympathetic tone. And as your cortisol is going up, of course, what happens is you start to, you know, break the tight junctions between the epithelial cells and now you're getting bacterial translocation as well as uh, presenting foods now that are either not as well digested or the peptides or proteins from that food are now you know, starting to be presented to antigen presenting cells. And so, you know, chronic stress, one of the biggest things that will affect the immune system, but can also be their diet. You know, you got, you know, it's, you'll would be amazed what I've heard um, some athletes are eating at a very high level. So let's start at the beginning. You know, and I want to go through this quickly you're, just because you're familiar. I want to get to more of the exciting stuff. But 15 million people suffer from a true IgE food allergy test, 4% of adults. You got about 15 to 20% have IgG mediated food intolerances. And I know there's a lot of like, oh, IgG doesn't count. IgG does count. Yes, it's because you're eating a food regularly. But if you've up regulating IgG, there is plenty of evidence in various studies that show that it leads to chronic meta-inflammatory situations where you're affecting metabolic inflammation. And then about 20% of the population all of their diet uh, do a perceived adverse food reaction. So you know, I, you know, obviously in the work that I do, I almost always start people with at least an elimination diet. But once they come in and they've got irritable bowel, They've got psoriatic arthritis. Uh, you know, it, you know, they have any type of autoimmunity. Uh, I'm go, I'm I'm testing for food allergies right away. Otherwise, I'm putting them on a you know modified low carb, low allergen diet to, just to begin with. So you know, you got to understand this if you're dealing with athletes. You got to understand their their metabolic signaling. So you know, your metabolism is the sum total of all the reactions going on in your body right now, and it's leading you either towards resiliency, vitality, and, and uh, aging gracefully, right? Or it's leading you down a path towards chronic meta-inflammatory processes that lead to a process known as inflam aging. Metabolism and weight loss and inflammation, aging, whole other topic I'd love to talk to you guys about sometime. 
And so understanding what's disrupting this becomes the key part to understanding how to really unwind uh, the complex issues for someone and then really rejuvenate them. And food allergies is at ground zero, guys. I mean, so many people have, you know, permeable guts. It's a problem. And you really want to try to address that. And the athletes in particular are prone for it. And the younger athletes are prone for it. You've got 15-year-old kids, 14-year-old kids, shoot. 10-year-old kids are training three and four hours a day now. And we make this mistake that these children are just little adult bodies. And so the stress can be more impactful. It can lead them to things, you know, like, you know, obstructed airway or exercise induced asthma or GI problems, or even you can think about mood changes because if the enteric nervous system gets activated, you know, mood's going to change. And so these are the key things that you always want to look at, right? So whether it's an athlete or somebody that's struggling with a health issue or just weight, um, what's their state of oxidative stress? You know, where's their redox potential at? Are they triggering inflammatory compounds? Where's their hormone balance at? You know, in athletes in particular, it's tragic, but they can't replace hormones to a natural level. And many athletes that I see end up with a little bit of, uh, you know, midline to lower, say, for example, in men, sex hormones. And in women, they get dysmenorrheas because of the amount they're training and how lean they are. And there's no ability because of current, you know, you know legal status for in, in terms of how they replace that to really help those individuals. Glucose, stress hormones, all important. And there we are with gut integrity and immune balance. Those are key aspects. And you can't separate the two out. When you, whether you have bad bugs, you're under stress, you're eating a poor diet, um, not getting enough fiber, you know, any number of things can start to trigger this gut immune imbalance. And I would just add brain to that as well. So, you know, what can cause it? I mean, so this is the beginning, right? So when you think of it, you have an epithelial lining that breaks. Now an allergen of any kind, it could be an allergen, it could be a protein, it could be a peptide, right? It doesn't have to be like you're sucking in pollen, right? It, you know, yeah, it could be uh, gluten, but guess what? It could be an almond. It could be broccoli. I mean, I know the last time I did a food allergy test and it took avocado out because I was probably eating too much. I wasn't happy about it. But even foods that you think are healthy for you could be driving this inflammatory response. And, uh, you know, athletes eat training table food unless they're given specific guidance. And so who knows what they're reacting to. So basically, you know, the allergen gets presented to the antigen presenting cell, which then is mediated through the Th2 cell, which then creates the epitope for IgE. Uh, and then that epitope for IgE as the allergen is now, you know, becomes activated, you know, triggers you know, basophils uh, to be released. So real easy clinical pearl. Basophils greater than one, realize they're hyperactivating their immune system. And usually they'll have heightened IL-6 as well as more histamine. So you'll get histamine, leukotrienes and cytokines all being released from this, uh, as well as eosinophils now releasing um, histamine as well. So the difference between allergies and sensitivities, I, I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but you should just realize you know, food allergies, the reactions are immediate and your airway starts to close and you get hives and you can't breathe. And those are pretty immediate and you need emergency measures and you probably should have an EpiPen with you at all times. Um, sensitivities usually are gradual. You eat a food and then 72 hours later, you're sore. And that's why in a lot of times with an athlete, it's difficult for them to identify those types of things. They're on the road. They don't remember what they ate two days ago, uh, but yet they're achy. They're not recovering quite as much. Um, you know, maybe their power is starting to go down, right? So their resiliency scores are off. So all of these things start to occur, the sensitivities being different from the anaphylaxis um, or allergies. And look, you can get anaphylactic to any food nowadays, right? Used to be it was, you know, it's shrimp, you know, it's tree nuts, you know, the classic, you know, dairy, maybe certain fish, right? Shellfish. Um, but now, you know, people's immune systems are pretty compromised. So, you know, so when you think of, you know, IgE, it's a pretty much an immediate response. When you think of IgG4, IgG4 is the epitope that gets developed as a complement to IgE, meaning that it's buffering the, the tendency to make IgE. 
The higher the IgG4, however, the more you know you're loading that allergen. And um, it, there's great papers on IgG4 now um, pushing it towards uh, the fact that it is uh, you know, autoimmune driving. So you get a lot of autoimmune activity that's driven by IgG4. So why it's important to measure both. And I, you know, how many people you have coming into your practice now that have, you know, autoimmunity, they're not quite autoimmune, but their ANA is positive, right? They got, they got antibodies to their thyroid now. So these are all the things that we're seeing more and more people are testing uh, for IgG4. So you should be on the lookout for that one. And why it's important once again, is that it's blocking the IgE epitope. Uh, but once again, if it's if it's going up high over time, that elevated IgG4 is going to lead to increased risk for autoimmunity. So, so what IgG4 is doing is trying to limit mast cell activation. Now, of course, we're all talking about mast cell activation syndromes now. Just remember, if someone has, say, for example, SIRS or kind of biotoxin exposure, they actually turn their histamine genes on and all their genes and their cells start making histamine. So it's not just mast cells. But then you have folks that don't have a SERS-related complex that you know do have just straight mast cell activation. Uh, IgG, of course, takes up to 72 hours, as I said, typically less severe than IgE. Yeah, your joint's going to ache, your brain's going to feel foggy, you're going to feel like you're pushing a thought through jello. You know, you know, you might not recover quite as great. May even it might even aggravate sleeping, right? Um, but it's a low-grade chronic inflammation that's going on, kind of feeds into that metaflammation model of a, a slow-burning fire that leads to that inflammate, that inflammaging uh, term, right? You're just aging because of inflammatory chemistry being excessive in your body. And of course, the C3BD complement, this is the complement to IgG sensitivity. If you are triggered on C3BD on a food allergy test, well, then that absolutely leads to a 10,000 fold increase in that immune response on IgG. So this is really significant to find out about C3BD because it's that application that's going on. And then you get, you know, you know, generalized inflammation once again from IgG, but that C3BD amplification is incredibly important. And then if you look down here, you see the development of C3BD uh, if you look here, so microbes or, uh, you know, apoptotic cells that are breaking down, you see that you trigger the, the complement pathway to move towards these specific subsets, which are basically, you know, being activated, you know, on the complement receptors, all of these leading to an increased immune response. So, uh, people, for example, that got COVID long haul, they, they saw the, 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 uh, C three uh, B one Q, I think it was, was like uh, really upregulated, right? Uh, so it was actually this right here, C one Q. So you, so, which doubt, which created all this pressure on the immune system afterwards. Why so many people were struggling with their, you know, post COVID experience? And of course, just remember that if your microbiota is altered early in life, which a lot of you know neonates come out as newborns. And now we have eosinophilic feel like esophagitis. There's whole hospital wings that are dedicated to correcting that in children who are incredibly sensitive. Whereas when I started in practice in 1983, um, yeah, I'd see a really allergic kid to foods every one great once in a while. Now you got whole, literally whole facilities that are working on this uh, for their, you know, with, with children. Right. So, and you know, if C-section babies, no bifidobacterium infantis being delivered. Obviously, their ground state is poor. And then it's the old story of, you know, it's it's diaper rash, eczema, allergies, asthma, autoimmunity. That is the movement as to what goes on. So getting the microflora right, incredibly important. Realize that chronic stress and the relationship between cortisol, insulin, glucose, and thyroid plays a role. Uh, if you just look here at stress and exercise and you look at the brain, uh, what we see is the brain telling the adrenal glands to release more catecholamines and glucocorticoids, which then alters the microbiota, can change gut hormones, and then trigger more inflammatory uh, compounds, 
Uh, so this is the this is kind of the basis. We're gonna get a little more we're gonna get a little bit more in depth in this, but this is kind of the thought process behind stress. So when people get under stress, and if you're an endurance runner, your body thinks that you're running from a white tiger for three hours. But you ever run from a white tiger for three hours? Usually you're either caught within a few minutes in your lunch or you scampered up a tree and you survived to fight another day, right? That was what fight or flight was for. Now we're using fight or flight to run a marathon, do a triathlon, do a Spartan race, do a Tough Mudder, right? There's all these different things that we're doing now to trigger sympathetic tone. And that's why these little smartwatches are kind of cool to kind of measure heart rate variability and, you know, REM sleep and deep sleep and two minute um, heart rate recovery from exercise. Because we got to get an idea when you're overly sympathetic dominant, the gut is going to break down. So are you really looking at the individual to figure out what's happening? Obviously, chronic stress, this is a fantastic uh, review article. But if you look at this, as cortisol is going up, your gonadotropin releasing hormone goes down. So the sex hormones go down. Not good for men or women athletes. Their growth hormone releasing hormone goes down. Not good for repair. And then, of course, they lose the ability to repair or create neurogenesis, and then they alter immune balance. And the outcome of this muscle loss and bone loss, I got, you know, professional players, especially in, in uh, gosh, in basketball, where they're getting stress fractures. They're getting tendinopathies, tendinosis, they're losing muscle mass. Uh, obviously, in the not training population, more syndrome X. In both populations, you can get the cognitive decline, especially if you add concussion risk onto it. And all of this leads to increased risk for fractures and frailty, um, increased risk in the future for heart disease as well. So the interesting thing on exercise is that the higher the trained athlete, because of their increased workloads, the more they push their baseline cortisol up. So they go, well, yeah, but they're athletes. That's good. They're ready to fight a white tiger. The problem is physiology is physiology your body um chemistry doesn't say oh you're an athlete click that button so that it's good to have those excess hormones one of the biggest things that breaks down an athlete is their their cortisol to testosterone ratio that's both in men and women so the higher the cortisol and the more the testosterone is dropped the more you're going to see problems with resiliency and the more increased risk of injury so, you know, cortisol and training in 2012, this is a great study. I just put it up because it's obvious. 304 amateur endurance athletes, 190 female, 114 male, 70 controls, and they measured hair cortisol, which actually is valid. Uh, and then they had a self-reported volume of exercise. On average, 42% higher cortisol level in endurance athletes. That makes sense. Later in life, they have heart issues. You know, elevated cortisol over time tends to cause reduced blood flow. You can start to get enlarged left ventricle because of insulin resistance. Um, you know, not to mention, you know, you know, the other issues that they have with injury, right? So this is kind of what it showed was the longer, uh oh, my light went out. Excuse me, guys. I don't know why that happened. Wanted to make sure you could see me. Sorry about that. But if you look, the volume of training, this kind of indicates the rise in cortisol, all right? So, you know, pretty interesting, right? So just any endurance athlete you've got, plan on them needing some help with their gut because the more cortisol you release, the more it's going to impact the gut and cortisol will impact bone loss as well. So especially cyclists because they're not weight bearing, right? Um, and then if you look at this, this is why it's so important. Here is why you develop food allergies. You, you, when you upregulate cortisol, IL-6, interleukin-6 gets upregulated in the brain and you get an increase in interleukin-6 release in the epithelium. And that triggers the expression of Claudin-2. And why that's important is Claudin-2 tells those tight junctions that are like this, keeping the bad stuff out and allowing the good stuff to filter through, they break. And now you have a leaky gut. And so, you know, it's basically this simple. You know, IL-6 hits the receptor, sends a signal to uh, the CDX2 binding sites, which then upregulates Claudin-2, the tight junction breaks. And now we get erosion of the epithelial cells and the integrity of the epithelial cell. So normally... Proteins go to peptides, peptides go to individual amino acids, and amino acids get into the bloodstream. That's what you want. The problem is 
with abnormal digestion or a leaky gut, proteins go to peptides. And it's not, not just insufficient enzymes. You could have sufficient enzymes. And then the peptides get through that epithelial tissue without being fully broken down. And now I got an allergen. And that's why we test for so many different kinds of you know, proteins uh, or you know, peptides will trigger a allergic response or a sensitivity response. And so if you think about it, um, stress triggers the HP. And this could be physical stress, emotional stress, mechanical stress, could be anything, right? Hypothalamus tells the spinal cord to regulate sympathetic tone. See the sympathetic output that goes through the enteric nervous system via the anachromaffin cells that triggers peripheral corticotropin releasing hormone. Now that's not good because you're going to inhibit melatonin by doing that on a chronic basis. But more importantly, you increase permeability to the gut. And then that peripheral corticotropin releasing hormone activates mast cells, which increases permeability to the gut. So we get gut permeability causing the antigens to be now presented because now they're getting through and going to the antigen presenting cells. And then the mast cells are triggering inflammation and immune activation, both of which circle back around and, and upregulate that hypothalamic activity again. So this is a circuit board. And it, it's pretty straightforward what's going to happen with individuals. So, you know, the job is, is, well, we got to get the, look, you can give people all the supplements you want. If you don't find out what foods are triggering this, and if you don't calm down that brain that's on fire, whether it's on fire due to metals or biotoxins or just stress, what peptides you might use to calm that down, things like relora or theanine, maybe on the nutrient side, you got to calm them down up here. And you got to repair down there in order to really get somewhere. So, you know, you look at the gut immune brain, it's, you know, it's where your body filters, it, you know, all of its nutrients to get them in. It's involved in defense and repair. It's our major physiologic interface with the outside world. And when it's, when it's working, we all feel good, right? Hey, I'm not bloated. I'm not gassy. I'm not walking into a store worried about where the next bathroom is, right? Like a typical IBS case has to, has to feel. And that, that's just it. When it's out of balance, you feel disordered and you feel unpredictable. You just get baseline anxious because you never know when the next gurgle is going to come, right? And so, you know, the next piece of this is understanding that, you know, brain, cognition, mood, emotion, you know, how your immune system is working here with your repair cycle. And then, of course, the gut being very sensitive because you're only one cell layer thick. So it's the interaction of these things that becomes incredibly important. And so if you want to know, well, what are the big things, the big drivers of this, obviously abnormal cortisol, elevated beta-2 microglobulins, uh, low melanocyte stimulating hormone, maybe, uh, you know, alterations in MTHFR. If you look at the immune side, it's looking at all the different factors that are triggering this. But what is the net net of this? Our gut breaks down. We start to react to food. You don't need to take a supplement every day. You do have to eat every day, right? So food is at ground zero. People eat every day, multiple times a day, triggering their immune system. And of course, this is just that whole aspect of this gut-brain connection of, you know, when the gut's, when the gut's straightened out, uh, when it gut's straight, you have a healthy central nervous system. Your HRV is good, right? Your heart rate recovery is good, you know? So, you know, if, that's great. When the gut's not so healthy, you start seeing changes in emotion and cognition uh, in their wearable data. And it's just important to realize that, you know, under stress, we start to alter the microbiota as well as allow that microbiota to, to enter the bloodstream. So, you know, lots of things are involved in this medications that people are on. If they're chronically taking NSAIDs, they can be on and off with corticosteroids. Uh, they could be eating poorly. Uh, you know, look, alcohol, alcohol is being used in many athletes to help them get to sleep because their game starts, you know, late at night or obviously they're discouraged from it, but it's still, it's a tradition that's happened. Um, environmental chemicals are triggers, vectors, right? Molds, funguses, bacteria, viruses, you know, you name it. And then of course, the TBI, all of these things can lead to gut dysregulation. Um, and these are all the drug therapies that can lead to drug dysregulation. Just 
finished a little ebook on drug induced microbiome disruption on all the different drugs that cause the microbiome to be disrupted. So people could be on drug therapy and training, right? People could be stressed out on drug therapy and training. Uh, and remember, this just isn't a personal, the professional athlete. How many people are going into to, uh, Orange Theory and killing it at a high rate, or you're doing hit training, or they're going to CrossFit, or they're training for that next big event, right? So you just got to keep that in mind. And then it's, of course, this is an old, old, I just love it though, because it says all organ systems evolved in heavy metal toxicity. And look, the numbers, central nervous system, peripheral nervous system, the gastrointestinal system who had a pyretic renal and cardiovascular. Well, guess what? A lot of load and demand and people that train regularly in all of those systems. And so if you're toxic, that's an issue. Here's the effect on a TBI. If you look at this, you see these, these are your, your uh, epithelial cells. Tight junctions are good. Now you get hit in the head and take a look here. Look at how the gut membrane is compromised within 10 minutes of a head hit. So this is in the ilium is where they took these, if I remember right. So, you know, what's it lead to? Translocation, sepsis, or multi-organ failure. Of course, at the very least, it increases permeability for individuals. So this is that big effect of the gut-brain axis and what, you know, how it impacts an individual once they've hit their head. And this, of course, is important just because I love to show the picture, you know, electron microscopy of a healthy gut. So A, C is a leaky gut. Look at all the cracks and crevices. It's like looking, it's like looking at a geographic tongue only in your intestine. And then look at the, look at the, uh, you know, your brush border here, right? And then look at the, the when it's leaky. So these are electron microscopy on you know, real people. So yes, as, as the gut gets broken down, you allow things to get through and that's going to trigger inflammation and you're going to develop food allergens. And you know when you look at uh, high intensity training, dysbiosis, upregulation of IL-6, upregulation of TNF-alpha, more uh, M1 monocytes, you know, so more inflammatory compounds being released. Uh, and I've got even, you know, more lipopolysaccharide, right? Which lipopolysaccharide is really what's triggering systemic inflammation. So, and, you know, lipopolysaccharide, obviously, when you're, when you're working out for a long period of time, you shunt blood away from your intestine, that makes the bugs die off. And now all of a sudden you're releasing lipopolysaccharide. And, you know, this is, look, this is a 2019 study. One of the big, you know, four things that leads to endotoxemia or excessive lipopolysaccharide, strenuous exercise. So the harder someone trains, it's that old story, bright stars burn fast. The harder you train, the, the less you're in homeostasis. If you're a moderate exerciser, um, it actually maintains your homeostasis. But, you know, I'm not going to tell you that. I, don't, I love to train hard. I just learned as I aged that I needed to have better rest and do more moderate exercise and pick less intense exercise, especially when I got past 60 a few years ago, right? So really important for um, you to understand that the harder you train, the more you choke out your, your beneficial floor, the more you're going to develop endotoxemia. The liver and the lymph have to clear it. When it can't clear it, it circulates and attaches to all your tissues and organs, especially thyroid for autoimmunity, you know, really, you know, attaches to the cardiac myocytes, can create some remodeling. And then there's people that are taking ibuprofen. If you look at ibuprofen, kidney function is worsened uh, post-race. Uh, so endotoxemia goes up as you're using ibuprofen in this study. And I've, I've had lots of people that go and do these ultra endurance races and they either end up with rhabdo or got close to it. Uh, but they were, you know, 40 years old, I'm going to go run my first triathlon and they training hard and sucking down eight, eight ibuprofen a day. And, uh, all of a sudden the wheels come off the cart on training day, you know, when you go for the race. So just realize that circulating endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide affects so many central things, histamine, TNF alpha, you know, um, more free radicals more stickiness of the blood, uh, less action on your insulin receptors. So you have, you know, you start to become a little bit insulin resistant. And so, you know, when you look at this, this is kind of the thought that, 
the higher the intensity, you start to create different types of stress. You get more hypoxia within the cell. You don't get enough oxygen to your tissues. You start to compress your four, six, and eight micron microcapillaries that are delivering oxygen into your tissues. Uh, you get more urea production. You get more lactic acid accumulation. Um, you get more free radical damage over time. You actually, your mitochondrial function ends up going down over time. Uh, and then duration adds to this too. All of this though can affect the gut microbiome. And, and uh, I think, you know, one of the projects we're working on right now is an AI a pro program that's tracking all of the studies on the microbiome that have ever occurred. And then we'll compare stool tests to it, not to sell a product, just to look at what's happening with all this world literature and applying AI to microbiome. It's pretty interesting. And then this kind of, this sums it up. So if you think about it, how many people do you know that exercise regularly? How many gyms are around your practices where you could go and talk about this? Are there any teams? Are there any high school teams, college teams? Do they have any certain people that are giving them problems? They can't recover. They can't repair. The longer your duration, do you notice the 30 minute time on there? So when people start to train past 30, and I'll even give them up to an hour, clearly when you start to go an hour or greater, things happen on the left. More gut discomfort risk, microbial diversity goes down, intestinal permeability goes up, you have more pro-inflammatory bacteria, you have more um, biomarkers for inflammation, your zonulin goes up, and when zonulin goes up, of course, you know, you're going to be very leaky and high zonulin is, is related to a whole bunch of different conditions and diseases. You know, C-reactive protein going up big, homocysteine going up as big, looking at things like adiponectin, which would be really good to measure for oxidative stress. Uh, and you get negative changes in the gut. And so their performance is altered. The higher the level of performance, the more the microbiota is altered. And then when you look over here on that 30 minute or less, right, you get more diversity, more intestinal metabolites, more uh, improvement in bacteria. So this to me was amazing. It's a 2022 uh, paper. And this is things that just re-echoes what I've seen the last 10 years. And there's been various publications kind of, you know, mapping out little pieces of this, but this anybody that is coming in your practice, you need to really talk to them about this. Why is zonulin so important? Well, it's because basically it's regulating these tight junctions as zonulin goes up, which it can go up due to a bacteria, can go up due to stress, right? Uh, in, in, you know, inflammatory signaling in the gut because you're maybe on a certain drug. Uh, and as so the bottom line is, is when zonulin is, is triggered, you have controlled antigen trafficking. When excess zonulin is present, you have uncontrolled antigen trafficking. And that leads to inflammatory cytokines and T-cell activation, loss of immune tolerance. Well, of course, remember guys, metaflammation leads to inflammation. This is ground zero for the inflammation signaling that causes aging. And this is a great review from Fasano in 2020. High zonulin. I just had a uh, brain glioma in a 14-year-old boy that had he had celiac sprue was undetected, and he ended up with a glioma, having to get it uh, excised, of course, or so had brain surgery. And we got him off of his gluten and repaired his gut, and now he's grown six inches. And we don't think of you know gluten intolerance or or a celiac causing a brain tumor, but it, but it does, and it can. And you know, obviously attention deficit and autism and you know, all sorts of issues around elevated zonulin. And then you know, when you look at a, a report from Infinite Allergy Labs, the best thing about the report is it clearly shows you what it's testing for I'd also say why I like Infinite Allergy Labs, and obviously I teach for them, is uh, they got great reproducibility, you know, and uh, they're they're they still get covered by insurance, which is pretty amazing. 
And I like that it does IgG, IgG4, IgE, and C3BD, all four categories. So I can take a look at, well, how severe is that reaction for that individual? And uh, obviously there's some environmental things that can be tested for as well, which is kind of a little bonus, doesn't really cost a lot more, but it's got a bonus. And then of course it tells you, you know, what is, you know, if you have less severe symptoms, it's gonna give you a mild list. Like what were the, what were the foods that triggered the hardest? And then, of course, if if you're an autoimmune case, you may have to avoid all the foods initially to get the load off of your immune system. Uh, and so it would list the bigger uh, order of foods that you need to get rid of. So mild symptoms. Hey, I'm performing. Um, I want to see if I can get maybe a little bit better recovery. Maybe you just have them do the mild symptom. If they're having symptoms while they're training, they probably need to do the severe one. And I found most of the, you know, most of the time they can work around it. And, and you know, just in summary, because I want to kind of keep to the 45 minute uh, timeline and then be able to have time for questions. Uh, you know, you got to give them a probiotic. And you know, I don't care what, you know, look, everybody's got their favorite probiotics. Uh, I'm big on making sure that the company can guarantee that each of the strains in a probiotic are actually there at the time. Uh, of expiration because when you put a bunch of probiotics together in a, in a, in a capsule or in a powder, they eat each other. They don't like each other. It's like the crypts in the blood. So you got to find compatible organisms and are they testing for those organisms? Obviously you can use digestive enzymes if they're gassy and bloater, you suspect low HCL. That's going to help to you know, be a secondary thing to do while someone's, you know, eliminating their foods. Love berberine and cat's claw. Uh, berberine is great for killing bugs. It helps to tighten the zonulin. Cat's claw, of course, an anti-inflammatory and kills off some bugs as well. Uh, and and remember, um, you can do things like peptides to help the gut lining. You know, lorazotide and KPV, for example. You know, lorazotide, fantastic for really reducing the, the zonulin levels. And KPV helps to regulate TNF-alpha. So there's some cool peptides for the gut now that I, I think is another tool in the toolbox, but you could do a lot just with, uh, you know, great natural approaches to, to uh, helping to balance out that gut. So Magicare would be another one. Magicare is excellent from the standpoint of uh, being able to modulate the immune system. So it's plant sterols and sterolins developed by Dr. Bert Buick in the, uh, in South Africa, and they developed it initially for HIV population. And then they found out that it's a great immunomodulator for a lot of folks. So I use it a lot for autoimmune cases. So it really helps to balance out Th1 and Th2. If you notice that circuit board, I had that Th2 dominance at the bottom because of all that sympathetic tone. So you got to try to push that back and keep the teeter-totter correct between Th1 and Th2. You know, I, I love... Um, this is a product out of Germany, actually, which is great for allergies and autoimmunity. It works on the Dectum-1 receptors and you spray it inside your cheek or you could spray it topically on, say, an eczema. Uh, so, you know, it's, you know, a beta-1-3-6 glucan. Uh, and basically it acts as an, you know, an immunomodulator as well. And, you know, this whole Dectum-1 receptor is becoming very popular because it turns out that, Oh, a lot of the big symptoms in SIRS cases, for example, um, are due to imbalances in Dectum-1 receptors. And, you know, bottom line is when you have an athlete who is training on a regular basis and their cortisol to testosterone ratios are off, or they're eating pizza and gummy worms after their events, um, or they're exposed for whatever reason. And once you add significant training into a person's life, more than one hour, heart rate should be in zone two, not above. People that are training hard in professional sports train above. Uh, you're going to start to develop a leaky gut. And I always tell people, I always ask people, if I line up 10 great looking specimens, men or women, man, they all look like athletes. How do you pick? the athlete that's the best is it how powerful they are well how powerful they are is dependent on 
how good their brain coherence is, which leads me to, they have special nervous systems, which are able to take the load and it not trigger things as quickly as many of us would. And so just keep that in mind that just because somebody looks really good and they tell you they're exercising, you got to look around, look at their percent monocytes, the eosinophils and basophils, right? That's an easy one. The basophils elevated, you got a lot of monocytes, um, eosinophils are high, their gut's leaky, you know? And then if they have symptoms or if they're trying to do it preventatively, test for food allergens. Remember, 20% of the population reported to have sensitivity. The you know, gut microbiome not only changes with age, but changes with medication. And with these changes in the microbiome, it becomes obvious that we start to create immune shifts and those immune shifts lead to food allergens and environmental allergens as well. So why test for food tests annually? It's easy because you want to lower the inflammation status of the individual. They're, we're raging. We're salmon swimming upstream against inflammation, guys. It's all taking us down eventually, right? But can we live a longer health span, maintain our health, be more active, not get injured when we try to be active as we're you know, in our 20s, 30s, and 40s or later? Um, just remember, any, age is a factor. Type of diet's a factor. Stress load, environmental burden. How much physical activity? What drugs are they on? Where's their nutrient status at? Uh, are they overweight or underweight or just right? Uh, all of these, you should be checking the box. And if somebody has one of these factors, you should be thinking about doing food allergy testing for them. Really important uh, to keep in mind that you have to eat every day. You don't have to take a supplement. You don't have to take a drug. Um, you don't have to exercise, but the one thing that everybody needs to do that influences their health is eat, eat food. And that food uh, can either be your friend or your foe. And it could be your foe, even though it's a healthy food, if your gut is leaky and permeable to due to the way you exercise. And this is kind of a summary fly, slide. So inflammatory choices, stress, emotions, and, and you know, infection, presence of lectins, maybe illness, low stomach acid, exposure to toxins. All of these things, let's put exercise in there and lack of sleep. All of these things lead to altered intestinal permeability, which then leads to food allergies, malnutrition, dysbiosis, and toxin overload, which then leads to systemic disease. So food is at the center of this. I'd encourage you to incorporate food testing. Uh, and I would, I would do it with trusted folks. So infinite allergy labs. Um, and you know, I'm not a direct rep for this. I'm reading these for you so I can, you know, let you know what the scoop is. Cash price, $349, or it can be zero if it's improved by insurance. I know we do that in our two offices. I have one in California and one in Texas. Uh, haven't raised the price at all. Even though supply costs have gone up, they've held to the price. Uh, they've passed their last three inspections with zero deficiencies. That is an efficient lab. Uh, it's part of the American proficiency testing and their turnaround time on this food allergy test from Infinite Allergy Labs is three to five business days. That is a major innovation. Um, I know this is what I use in my practice. Uh, I'm happy with the results I get. I'm happy with the turnaround time. Uh, many times because people are coming to me with problems, GI problems, skin problems, psoriatic problems. We're getting it covered by insurance if they've got a PPO. Uh, and if not, you know, they pay cash. 349 is not a bad price, right? And then the other piece to this is so for the summer offer of you know fit for summer, 25% off all fast testing or food and allergy sensitivity testing through infinite when they're ordered all the way through the month of June using Rupa. Uh, I think you have a coupon code. There is no limit to this, it expires June 30th. That's a pretty significant offer. And I think if uh, and I think uh, if you're not using infinite allergy labs right now, you should consider trying it right now because you get them at a discount. And uh, I guess we're ready for some questions. All right. 
That was amazing. I always love your presentations, Dr. Lavelle. That was, that was fantastic. We had a ton of questions coming in, so we'll get through as many as we can over the next 10 minutes. And folks, if you have to jump off, no worries. We are recording this as we always do, and we will distribute it within the next few days, along with that coupon code that uh, was just spoken about. So this is a bit of a layup to start off. Which lab do you use to test IgG, IgGa, and IgE? So IgG, IgG4, uh, IgE and C3BD is obviously infinite allergy labs. I there mean, that's a, that's a quickie. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And so again, y'all, this is a presentation with infinite allergy, our lovely partners. Uh, is it premature to say that food allergies and sensitivities can result in slower reaction time to stimuli and less sharp reflexes? No, it's not premature because once you start to lose brain coherence, like what we have with the Corvette race team, where we amended their diet, we corrected for their amino acids, got their guts, you know, in shape. And then we gave them something, you know, we used a nasal spray to kind of keep their brains sharp as well. Well, the problem they were having is they were race driving and we measured their brain coherence through looking at core body temperature. And as their core body temperature went up, their reflex time goes down or goes up. They lose reflex time. So yeah, anything that triggers brain, brain inflammation is going to trigger a lack of coherence and you're not going to have good reflexes. Absolutely. What do you do if a patient has high free cortisol, but very low metabolized cortisol? I still just dampen that cortisol, dampen it down, man. Just you know, high cortisol. When you look at high free cortisol, by default, that is triggering loss of sex hormone production, loss of growth hormone, triggering shifts in the immune system and reducing neurogenesis. So you don't rebud new neurons. Your, your progenitor cells for your neurons never mature to a dendritically pruned neuron because of that high cortisol, because it binds to that progenitor cell and inhibits its growth. So you got to bring that cortisol down. I love using the Laura. That's a biggie for me. Phosphorylated serine, another biggie for me, but I'm a big fan of Relora for that. Great. Are there certain steps that a patient should take prior to basically when they're prepping to take their sample to ensure that the findings are as accurate as possible? I mean, for me, I've always just taken their blood. I don't care whether they've eaten or not eaten because it's showing me a real time yep. effect. So no, they don't need to, like in a toxic metal test, don't eat fish for seven days before. And, you know, now, obviously if you're on hydro, if you're on cortisone, say you've just finished a medrol dose pack or something, you know, you've really suppressed your immune response. You may want to wait a, a, a week or two to do that test. But other than that, they're going to show up. The, 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 the allergies are going to show up. So this practitioner had a large percentage of patients. Oh, there we go. Back in the dark. Like, it's okay. I'm feeling like Halloween right now. I'm like, yeah, there we go. Yeah, we'll keep it. We'll do it live. Yeah. Uh, this practitioner had a large percentage of patients test polyreactive. Almost everything's in the red on the food sensitivity tests. Uh, they were taught that this is most likely from the immune system overactivation, either chronic mold exposure or severe gluten sensitivity. Would you agree with approaching these patients from those areas in these cases? If you have a lot of C3BD cases, if they're talking about a, a red activation on C3BD or the complement pathway, absolutely. We saw that both in um, post-vaccine, we saw it in SERS cases. So what you have to do is you have to start to work on those individuals uh, by soaking up those inflammatory compounds, whether you're using Welco or cholestyramine or using maybe a, a okra complex, along with using something to act as a, a bioacid you know, agent to kind of help carry those out. Um, if it's gluten, I love the peptide lorazotide and KPV because it just seals the gut lining quickly. But if you start to do that, you'll start to see that they, they won't be testing for as many foods. So yeah, in those kind of cases, that's somebody who really has a significant immune burden. Yeah. Would you use red light therapy for lactic acid breakdown for runners? Yeah. I mean, it's getting kind of popular. Some people mm -hmm. are doing it and uh, I'm fine with that. Um, I'm not as big a cryo guy. I'm still not convinced about cryo. I think the cold thing's pretty good, but uh, love the, yeah, red light therapy, I think is pretty, pretty solid. Nice. What, okay, here we go. Here's a good one. Uh, cooked versus uncooked foods. Where do they fit in the scope of the food sensitivity and allergy testing? You know, it, in the end, the proteins that you have, while you may see a little bit of denaturing with cooking versus not, you know, you're, you're going to test. If you're allergic to broccoli, you're allergic to broccoli. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no worries there. You got to be careful about not uh, overdoing it. <laughs> 
you know, like overthinking the process, just test for the food, take it off. Yep. So then it's like, well, if I do it, if I do a sous vide, is that different versus doing blanching versus right? And all yeah. of a sudden I start getting really granular. Of course, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't want to go that way. 100 percent Yeah. Elimination diet just and every single potential option. Uh, exactly. 25 years. Right. Which botanicals and supplements have you seen not lower zonulin as quickly as practitioners would hope? Well, I mean, there's not that many that are triggered that really do it directly, but you can look at cat's claw, I think is pretty good at immune modulation of the gut and it helps to restore that. Berberine, I get mixed results. I think it's it's good. I think in general, if you start to take away why am I having the zonulin upregulated? Is it infection or you know whatever it is? then you're in pretty good shape to try to get that, that, that to be restored. Like I said, I chair the International Peptide Society, you know, and, and so we've had tremendous success on using lorazotide in, in a, a peptide of three amino acid chain peptide called KPV, which uh, really downregulates zonulin. And, and we've been seeing, I mean, I'd struggle with people for six months sometimes getting them to get, really get their gut in the right direction. And now it's like cut by 60%. So that's been a big, that's been a big, I think, uh, aha over the last couple of years. Is there, do you know what the threshold for zonulin is? The threshold level? Uh, I think it depends on what lab you're at, but I think the one lab was 34 was the threshold at less than 34 uh, was the, was the value. But uh, you know, you're going to, you have different labs that may have different uh, threshold values. Yeah. Under what circumstances might an athlete gain sudden increase in food sensitivities within a matter of days or weeks uh, over training for days on end and other reasons? Well, were they on any medication? Mm -hmm. Overtraining is a big one. Loss of sleep. Um, th those are probably the three biggest, which could happen. They could be given a drug that causes a big change in their gut permeability, which happens. I mean, I've seen it happen. It's typically overtraining is the biggest one. People just don't understand that it's not good to go all out. I just talked to someone this morning. I mean, they're a mold patient and like they're puking, throwing up in a, in a high metabolic class. And his, you know, his VO2 max is 24, which isn't good, by the way, if you're not familiar. And it's like, uh, you shouldn't be doing high sympathetic training when you're that kind of person because his pulmonary output is low. Mm -hmm. It's like, dial it back, you know, train moderate. So we got a lot of people that end up overtraining and triggering these kind of immediate reactions uh, in the immune system. And just think of it this way. They just, it was like, it was a straw that broke the camel's back. They were getting ready to become sensitive. Then it was one event mm -hmm. that over that edge. Yeah. It makes, it makes some sense. What about female athletes on birth control and what that does to the gut? Well, I mean, we know right away that you get uh, a dysbiosis with oral contraceptives, right? That uh, women tend to get more candida because of that. Um, they also can get a little more permeable with that. So you have to work harder. You know, you got to make sure if they're going to be on, if they're on oral contraceptives, prebiotic, be on a probiotic uh, at minimum. I also like athletes, if they're endurance athletes, like a lot of women who are endurance runners who are already prone towards irritable bowel, because maybe they have a little bit of a body dysmorphia going on. Um, and this is happening in men now too. So I'm not, you know, oh, yeah. creating any gender bias. There's a lot more men now with this type of body dysmorphia going on, but they need glutamine because when you train, you use your glutamine up. And when you use glutamine up, it also, you steal it from your epithelial cells because your epithelial cells in your intestine have double the glutamine of any other cells in your body. So you go and you rob the epithelial cells and now you start eroding the gut. So probiotics, epithelial, prebiotics, minimum, along with a multivitamin for women on oral contraceptives, because they deplete so many nutrients are real prone for depression because of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Lavelle, always a pleasure. We are at the hour mark. And so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. Do you have any final thoughts or uh, notes for the folks who joined today? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is, is just because someone walks in and they're in shape and they look really good and they tell you they're an athlete, don't prejudice them into thinking they're healthy. That's the piece that many times that beautiful body that's is sitting in front of you, uh, they actually have a lot going on. They're kind of sick. 
You know, mm -hmm. they got a lot of issues that are happening. Yeah. So that's probably my biggest thing. I hope people realize, you know, don't prejudice. Oh, it's got to be somebody overweight or somebody that looks sickly walking in to think they need food allergy testing. If the, the more they train, the more you need to think about the imbalances. Makes ton of sense. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you to Infinite Allergy. And folks, for those of you who are able to stick around, I'm going to jump into a demonstration of Rupa Health and show you exactly how to order the fast test on Rupa. Let's jump right into it. And folks, for those of you who are joining and may have uh, not seen one of these live classes before, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. Not only am I the host of these wonderful classes that we do, but I'm also the person who's responsible for making sure that you're set up for success when using Rupa Health, me and my team here at Rupa. So what is Rupa Health? We are a functional medicine lab platform designed to eliminate the pain points when it comes to lab testing for you and for your patients. Now, when you think about lab testing, you have likely multiple different labs that you're working through, right? Maybe you have your tests for your food sensitivities. Maybe you have a test for your gut. Maybe you have a hormones test, right? And all these are offered by different labs. What we do here at Rupa Health is we bring them all into one platform. So you can easily access over 30 different labs, of course, including infinite allergy uh, and over 3000 tests all in one place. Beyond that, we'll also take care of the patient experience. So as soon as you press send on that order, we will reach out to your patients and handle the whole support side. We can handle billing, we'll handle specimen issues, essentially all those things that would take time out of your day. We will go ahead and handle that for you just to show you how simple it is to start an order on Rupa Health. We just need your patient's first name, last name, and email address. From there, you're into your order screen. This is here. You can create custom bundles. So if you want to create a bundle with an infinite allergy test and then add a couple of other supplemental tests in there, you can go ahead and do that. And it's one click added into your card straight away. Down below that, you have the ability to create a favorite screen. So favorites are your individual tests that you commonly order. So when I'm ready to order that fast test from infinite allergy, one click add it into my cart, we'll have a 25% off coupon for you. And we'll just go ahead and click send a patient. And that is how easy it is to order that infinite allergy test directly on Rupa Health. But as you can see, if I want to maybe order a GI map along with it, or a Dutch hormones test, or really any test from again, the 30 plus partners that we work with, one click, two clicks, three clicks, you're done. From there, we'll reach out to the patient. We'll handle billing if you want us to, or you can handle billing directly with us and handle billing with your patient separately, meaning you can pay for the tests yourself. It's completely up to you, but we'll still handle the support, the specimen issues, you name it. From there, you'll go ahead and get the results back in. I don't know if you all remember that old infomercial, maybe from like the early 2000s, set it and forget it. It was like an old like microwave, I think. Set it, forget it. Click send on your orders, forget about the order. We'll handle everything on the in-between. Then you're getting the results right back into your Rupa Health dashboard where you can track everything straight away. So you can track the progress and status of your orders, see when the sample arrived at the lab, when you can expect the results to come in. And once those results are in, you're able to download them. You can send them to your patients. And then from there, you can even schedule clinical consultations. So if you want some assistance interpreting the results with a uh, clinician from the lab that you're ordering from, you have the ability to schedule time with the lab that you're ordering the tests from. Still have full access there. So what we're doing here is streamlining a process that ultimately would take time traditionally out of your day, offloading it onto your shoulders onto ours. Rupa Health is completely free to sign up for. So you'll be able to create an account within five minutes, sign up for free, the way that we generate our revenue is on each order, there's a 7% processing and ordering fee, which is paid for by whoever pays for the tests. So if you're having us manage billing directly with the patient, then your patient will pay not only for the cost of the test, but also that 7%. What that means for you is that Rupa is completely free, y'all. It's completely free if you're having us bill the patient directly. But not only is Rupa a place where you can come and order your tests, it's also a place where you can come, as you can see, and learn about your tests. We do these webinars on a regular basis. So you're able to join these webinars for free. We even have boot camps that we do. So six week deep dive classes that you'll be able to join into sessions and learn about tests. They traditionally come with testing as well. So you pay the cost of the boot camp. You'll get a test that comes along with that cost. 
do the test on yourself and be able to ask professional clinicians as to what's happening and experience the test for yourself. You can see the upcoming boot camps or excuse me, live classes that we have. We have one next week with another one of my favorite clinicians, Dr. Robert Silverman. We have another one coming up about Ackermansia, which is a very interesting uh, supplement. So very excited for those upcoming ones. Of course, you even have access to all the previous sessions that we've done, including those with Dr. Jim Lavelle. We have a magazine where we're producing over 100 articles every single month. You can hop in here and find resources. We have a podcast, even Dr. Kate Henry, our head of medical education, is the host of that fantastic podcast. You can get access to all the previous podcasts that we've done as they come out. Go ahead and give them a listen. Top 10 in Apple podcast when it comes to the medical side of things. Dr. Dickon Weatherby, Dr. Carrie Jones, one of my favorite humans on the planet. You have it all here. So again, Group of Health, completely free to sign up for, access over 30 different labs, all in one place, over 3,000 different tests, as well as learn about the tests through our educational platform. So I know that was a lot, but I'm going to add my contact information up here, and I'm going to go through the chat to see if there's any questions that came in. So here's my contact information. Again, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm just going to go into slideshow mode so you all can see it. And here we go. Let's hop in. How do we get a copy of the slide deck? I sent it a couple of times in the chat, but it will be sent out again with the recordings um, within the coming days. So our team will do some uh, editing to the video, and then we'll go ahead and disperse that along with the slides. Additionally, it will uh, be uploaded into our uh, main page, which I saw, which I showed you a moment ago. Does Rupa integrate with any EHRs? Great question. We do. We actually integrate with a lot of EHRs. Um, we integrate, I'm not going to name them all, but you know, some of the top ones would be um, Practice Better. We're actually launching Serbo in a couple of weeks. So very excited about that. Uh, Get Healthy actually just launched a couple of days ago. So we actually have a whole list. Uh, Dr. Harrell, let me know if you're available in the chat, what EHR you work with. And then I'll be able to let you know if we work with them or if they're on the docket for us. Hi, Adrian, is there a way to get the questions, get the questions answered? Uh, Sarita, I can reach out to Dr. Lavelle, but since just we had probably 40 questions come in and just for the sake of time, we're not able to answer any question. Unfortunately, there's a limitation just within these shorter webinars that we do. But if you have any questions, the team over at um, Infinite Allergy is available for uh, any direct questions if you order a test. Good information. We'll love to attend the sessions and some of the topics. Hey, sign up for uh, Rupa Health and you'll get a notification as to when we're always doing these. Adrian, can you please send me this presentation separately? We will go ahead and send out the presentations always to the email that you registered for. And I think that's all the questions that came in for me. Charm. Oh my gosh, Dr. Harold. Yes. So we're in contact with Charm. Um, there's no timeline for when that's going to launch yet, but it is a highly requested EHR. We're very well aware of it. Um, and let's just say the ball's in their court right now. They know we want to work together. We've talked to their team, uh, but we're just waiting for that integration and next steps. Awesome. All right, y'all. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in for me, but if you do have any questions, thank you so much. Uh, or feel free to reach out to me directly. Excuse me. Let me go back and slide. Feel free to reach out to me directly and we will go ahead and get those answered for you. Uh, again, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships at Rupa Health. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Again, thank you so much to the team over at Infinite Allergy, Dr. Lavelle. Uh, I love doing these all. So I appreciate you spending the time with me this afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day and I'll see you next week.